Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the lectures on uh, developmental evolution of reproduction. Uh, my name is Günther Wagner. I'm organizing the seminar series. And uh, uh, today we will talk finally about a topic that I think uh, many of you expected uh, maybe earlier in the in this um, in this series, uh, namely talking about the placenta uh, itself. Um, to do that, we are um, uh, lucky to have one of the foremost leaders in this area, the evolution of uh, of uh, the placenta, uh, with us today, uh, Dr. Derek Wildman from uh, Florida Southern University, and um, uh, and you know Derek is a, a pioneer in the genomic approach to uh, evolution of placentation, and I'm looking forward to his talk today. Derek, please go ahead. Thank you, Gunter. It's, it's an honor to be here and to speak to the uh, perinatology research branch and any others who may be joining. Um, wonderful place, uh, a, lot of, a lot of innovation at the PRB. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to go through this fairly rapidly and um, try to give a broad overview of the evolution of the placenta. Um, and uh, um, and placentation as well. Um, I couldn't be speaking without the help of a lot of other people, some of whom I'll mention, some of who I'll unfortunately neglect. Any omissions and errors are my own fault and not the fault of anyone else. Um, so I'll be talking about evolution at different time scales because when we talk about the evolution of the placenta, we need to think about it in terms of deep time. Um, in mammalian evolution, we can think about it in generally the context of 150 million years, which is many, many um, generations, more than I care to count. Um, and there's adaptations going on all the time. And what we see in the placenta is a very rapid evolution in different um, lineages. Um, but some aspects of the placenta have, may, have remained conserved in, in, in other lineages. I'll also talk about recent time um, since uh, we're interested in, in human placentation and pregnancy. Um, you know, there's adaptations going on even today within the human species um, and in the last several thousand years. And I'll touch on those a bit. So, um, since we're talking about evolution, I'll, I'll start with the concept of natural selection and Charles Darwin, who had this quote, and what we're looking here is a fetal skull. And um, the sutures, he said, the sutures in the skulls of young mammals have been advanced as a beautiful adaptation for aiding parturition. And no doubt they facilitate or may be indispensable for this act because the skull can, can um, change shape as it makes its way through the birth canal. However, Darwin realized that um, sutures also occur in the skulls of young birds and reptiles who only have to escape from a broken egg. And so we may infer that this structure has arisen from the laws of growth and has been taken advantage of in the parturition of the higher mammals. So, um, so um, it's impossible to grow uh, a full skull with a brain inside. So we have growth plates in our in in our different um, skull bones, and and they they merge together at the end, and that that helps us, but it's it's not a necessary feature for 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 life. But. You know, Darwin had a grandfather, and and his name was Erasmus Darwin. He was the founder of something called the Lunar Society, which was um, a uh, contemporary society of the Royal Society over in England. And um, that's where the word lunatics comes from, by the way. Um, but um, he thought about placentation um, 60 years before his grandson was writing about it. And so he wrote here that um, all quadrupeds and mankind in their embryon state are aquatic mammals. 
In our case, it's in the amniotic sac, and thus may be said to resemble gnats and frogs. The fetus in the uterus has an organ called the placenta. The fine extremities of the vessels of which permeate the arteries of the uterus and the blood of the fetus becomes thus oxygenated from the passing stream of the maternal arterial blood, exactly as is done by the gills of fish from the stream of water, um, which they occasion to pass through them. So, so Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin, both realized that a lot of the evolutionary roots of placentation had um, some sort of ancient origin. I'll also point out that at this time when, um, when Erasmus Darwin was writing this, the, the concept of oxygen was still controversial. It had only been first described in 1774, and there were still debates about whether or not it, it existed. And scientific debates go on today. So um, that's, just a, that's just an editorial comment. When we think about the evolution of the human placenta, the, the most fundamental question we can ask ourselves is what good is it for anyway? I mean, if, if you can be in an egg, you get all your nutrients um, while, while you develop. And, and so, so possibly there's some advent, advantageous benefits um, for having a placenta um, in, in mammals and other creatures. Um, in certain conditions, it, it, it may, um, offer some, some sort of advantage. And one odd thing about the placenta is that um, it expresses the proteins of the father in it because um, these are mostly fetal tissues in, in the placenta. So um, half the alleles are the paternal alleles and they produce proteins that in normal circumstances, like in, this, in the case of a of an organ transplant, they would be rejected by the mother. So Sir Peter Medawar, who was one of the co-winners of the Nobel Prize for coming up with the concept of immune tolerance, um, had this question, how does the pregnant mother contrive to nourish within itself for many weeks or months a fetus that is an antigenically foreign body? In other words, why is the fetus not um, rejected as would be a kidney? And so this, this leads into the, the concept of maternal fetal conflict and maternal fetal cooperation, both of which um, presumably exist in the context of the developing fetus. And um, we can think about um, conflict and harmony at different levels of biological organization. So we can think about it at the population level with humans and microbes, um, the punishment if you don't, if you don't um, pull off pregnancy correctly is extinction. We can think about it at the organismal level, um, mothers, fa fathers, fetuses, and kins. And the, the reward, if we're thinking about this in a game theory context, would be live birth. And the punishment um, when, when conflict was too much would be fetal death, or in many cases, maternal death. At the organ level, we can think about the placenta and the uterus and how they promote fetal growth and development. Punishment can be things like placenta previa and other, other um, problems in, in, um, in um, organ development um, during gestation. You can think about it in the intercellular level in terms of trophoblasts and immune cells. Um, the, the reward is that the placenta does um, produce a lot of um, developmentally important hormones that help the, the growth of the fetus. Um, the, the, the punishment is that um, with the immune cells especially is, is inflammation. Um, at the intracellular level, we can think of genes and transcripts and proteins. Um, the reward being that um, certain genes can be turned on and activated um, during fetal development, and the punishment can be genes can get turned off. Um, and, and we see a lot of this in the concepts of genomic imprinting and things like that. All sorts of covariates affect all of these levels, including environmental exposures, the maternal phenom phenotype, preterm birth risk factors, and the number of offspring that are um, gestating in, in the womb. 
So this is just a little cartoon of the, the placenta. And we see on the left, um, the trophoblast is, is moving into the right side, which is the maternal decidua. We see um, maternal cells, um, natural killer cells, uh, B cells, T cells, um, stromal cells, all coming into contact with placental cells. And that's the, um, the interesting paradox of pregnancy that Medawar talked about is how, how do these things interact, cooperate um, without, without um, destroying each other. Now, when we have to think about evolution, we have to think about it in the big picture. And so this is a, a, a tree of life um, uh, graph that, that shows all of, well, not all, but is a cartoon showing many organisms and their evolutionary history and how they're related to one another. And so we see the three main domains of life of bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and then within the eukaryotes, which is mainly what we're interested in here, um, you know, plants, fungi, um, and then protostomes and, and deuterostomes, um, and way on the right are mammals. So if we think about placentation, what we're really talking about and, and what Erasmus Darwin alluded to was a physiological exchange between the parent and the developing offspring. This is a very common thing in, in um, eukaryotic biology. For example, when you've cut up a bell pepper at, at, when you're making dinner, you'll see these so-called seeds of the pepper, but actually those are the developing embryos. And there's, a, there's an exchange um, between, between tissues there. There are creatures such as velvet worms, which are, um, belong to the phyla called Anicophora, um, which is a very distantly related phyla to our phylum to our own um, velvet worms. They're tropical animals that actually have live birth in many cases. And as you can see here in this um, bottom picture, there's a placenta-like structure in which the developing embryo attaches to the to the parent velvet worm, and physiological exchange occurs. We also see that in um, seahorses and their close relatives, pipefish. Um, and this is an interesting case because um, it's the father that is the pregnant individual in, in these cases. Um, the, the mother will um, deposit her eggs into a brood pouch in, in the father, and the embryos will develop in the father, and the circulation of the of the um, father comes in direct contact with the developing embryos um, and physiologic exchange occurs as you see in the, the bottom right panel. In mammals, um, placental variation is also quite, um, quite um, common and diverse. And so you can see a human placenta, which is a picture taken at the PRB. You can see, uh, Clipspringer antelope, another um, picture we took at the PRB, um, looks very different, um, more like a sea anemone or something like that. And then uh, an opossum um, we see here, and, and I have um, Gunter Wagner to thank for sending me this opossum placenta. Um, so we've looked at the evolution of placental structure in terms of the interface, which is the degree of intimacy between the fetal and maternal compartments. We've looked at shape, we've looked at how the um, tissues come together in terms of um, the connection between the maternal and fetal compartments, which is something called interdigitation. So our placenta, human placenta, is a, has a hemochorial interface, a discoid shape, and a villus interdigitation. Just reiterating that here. And again, getting historical in terms of evolutionary biology, if you look at the, the panel on the left, you see Ernst Haeckel, who's a, a, a German evolutionary biologist in the 1880s. Um, this is a translation of a tree he made. And what you see is that man is on the very top of the tree. And um, the idea he had was that life gets more complex as evolution occurs. That sort of view is, um, 
sort of out of favor. Um, and if you look at the, the 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 tree on the right, which is from the Tree of Life project, um, you'll see that humans are not even depicted on this tree. Um, the part of the tree where um, we would be is represented by uh, this green frog. And um, frogs and us, since we last had a common ancestor, one could argue from a genomic perspective, have each evolved um, nearly as much. But Haeckel was very into placentas. He thought they were um, very important to understand evolution. And he divided placental animals into two divisions. Um, the lower placental animals, which he called indeciduate or indeciduata, and the higher placental animals, which he called deciduate. Um, indeciduata includes things like tapirs, and this is a Perswalski horse, um, other, other types of artiodactyls, um, whales, dolphins, manatees, um, and, and, and so on. And then the deciduata includes ourselves, uh, chimpanzees, other primates, uh, rodents, hedgehogs, elephants, bats, um, carnivores, amongst other things. So we're more interested in the deciduata um, in terms of human evolution and Haeckel divided the deciduata into two types, the zono versus the disco placentalia. And he obviously had that term well before the 1970s and the advent of disco music. Um, so in the zono placentalia, here's some more examples here. Um, we see um, the disco placentalia, which we and rodents such as mice um, share a disc shaped um, placenta. And, and here's some more examples of, of them. Um, since Haeckel's time, where he thought of evolution as a, as a constantly advancing um, process, we've come up with better phylogenetic trees, uh, better descriptions of the anatomy of the placenta, and also statistical methods for evolutionary inference. And so if you look at the current view of placental mammal phylogeny, probably the best view is on the right, which shows how the 26 orders of mammals are, of placental mammals are related to one another. Uh, sort of um, bird's eye view of that is on the left, where we see there are four main clades of placental mammals, which are the Afrotheria, which include organisms like elephants, the Xenarthra, which includes armadillos, the Laurasiotheria, which includes artiodactyls like cows and, and carnivores and, and others, and then the Euarchontoglires, which is where humans fall with our close relatives, the other primates, rabbits and rodents, amongst a few other orders that are not mentioned there. So if we look at the shapes of placentas, we see um, the disc shape, as I've already mentioned. Um, cows have um, cotyledonary placentas, which are basically like polka dots of interfaces where the uh, placenta comes into contact with the uterus. Um, horses have diffuse placentas and carnivores and elephants have a interesting belt-like zonary placental shape. So here's a dog um, that we took a picture of, dog fetus that we took a picture of in our lab. And uh, one of the grad students um, made this nice, nice um, drawing. And uh, um, you can see the, the zonary um, placenta, very different than our own placenta. As far as interdigitation occurs, um, we have the, the villus type of placenta which you can think of as, as a branching tree, um, which is a fairly interdigitated form, folded placentas you see in marsupials and pigs. Um, the other types you'll see in some carnivores or, or some rabbits and, the, and, the, and New World monkeys and the labyrinthian type you'll see in rodents. And that's the most interdigitated type of placenta. 
at the interface, what happens is as the placenta invades into the uterus, um, depending on what species you are, it invades, um, the, the connection becomes more intimate. So in an epithelial corial placenta, like seen here in a cow, you have maternal cells on the left and fetal cells on the right. And the yellow maternal cells are maternal epithelial cells that are still there. In a dog, those epithelial cells are destroyed. And so it's called an endothelial corial placenta because the, the fetal cells are in contact with the endothelium. And then in a hemochorial placenta like we have, even many of those endothelial cells are destroyed. And so we have direct contact of trophoblast cells with maternal blood. And that's an interesting challenge for the immune system. So if we evolve this last thing, we can see most of these creatures have hemochorial placentas. Um, as, as are shown here. Um, and this is, this is um, what we see for the ancestral state of, of mammals. And I apologize for the animation messing up. Um, but you can see it here in another paper um, that shows that it's most likely that the hemochorial placenta is the ancestral form for placental or, or um, eutherian mammals. And um, the, the other forms, the epithelial choral and the endothelial choral placentas emerged um, later in evolution. So the primate placenta interface, in other words, ours, which is hemochorial, is ancestral rather than derived. Um, so when you think about that, the, the one thing that pops to mind is, well, that's interesting from an anatomical perspective. How does that work at the level of gene expression? So we did a study a few years ago where we got placentas from quite a number of species here, um, most of which we collected. A couple we got data from, from the databases that, that are already available um, online. And we sequenced the transcriptomes of, of all these organisms in, from their placentas, and then we aligned those sequences and, and tried to figure out some inferences about the evolution of gene expression. These are from term placentas. So it's really tough because there's so much variation in terms of gestational period and litter size. These are just two factors that vary quite a bit. So in a mouse, you know, 20 days, in a possum, 15 days versus um, something like an elephant, 644 days. So that's a great range of, of difference. And then in litter size, you can see it varies from one in, in many of these species up to about seven in possums, six to 12 in mice and, and so forth. So, th so there's a lot of variation um, suggesting that this is a very preliminary study that, that um, Needs, needs a lot more um, gestational time point um, testing and also um, increased tax on sampling. And so if we look at the variation in morphology, we'll see again, it's all over the map in the different species in terms of their um, interface and their, their, their membrane. And that is, this variation is really highlighted by this, this slide here, which shows that of, in all these species, 14 species, only 115 of the 20,000 or so protein coding orthologous genes are expressed in the placentas of all these creatures. So what is going on in the placentas is, varying from species to species, which, which um, makes it difficult for um, designing animal studies and um, just understanding what is actually going on. And so um, that's a very um, interesting finding that just shows, you know, what, what diversity actually exists in these, in these um, varying creatures. If, if, so how do we define what are these 115 genes? Um, so, so, so that just, we had to have a decent measure of, of gene expression, uh, a certain number of transcripts, um, 
many things that are expressed in the core transcriptome include things like annexins, which are involved in the resolution of inflammation. I'm sure many of you have read about them in the context of obstetrical syndromes um, and in, in important in maintaining the anti-inflammatory state in pregnancy. And um, there's also um, genes involved in cell-to-cell -cell interaction, vesicle trafficking, and von Willebrand factor secretion. Um, one TIMP3 that is expressed in all the different species has been implicated in preeclampsia, and, in, and, and that's an interesting thing, preeclampsia. Um, we've also studied galactins, which are regu major regulators of pregnancy and fetal and maternal tissues. Some of these galactins are expressed everywhere and by everywhere, I mean in all the different species. Um, primates have had an, uh, an expansion of galactins um, in a specific gene cluster on chromosome 19. Uh, Gabor Than from the PRB uh, led some of those studies, um, but the galactins have been around for a long time. One interesting thing, I mentioned TIMP3 and preeclampsia. Um, if we look at the different lineages, we can see which genes are expressed only in what species or what group of species. And um, there's 300 genes that are differentially expressed in the human placenta compared to all other species. And many of these genes have been implicated in preeclampsia, um, such as uh, CRH, KISS1, PAPA, ADAM12, um, these genes all have been shown to be um, dysregulated in preeclampsia. And interestingly, preeclampsia is a, a obstetrical syndrome that you pretty much only see in humans. So, so this is a way you can find um, some candidate genes because I said the ones that have already been implicated, but there's 300 genes that are differentially expressed in the human placenta. Some of those may also be implicated in, in preeclampsia as, as we learn more about them. And uh, just to bring that point home, preeclampsia, um, which has been considered a, a, a disease of abnormal placentation um, is, is, is common in humans as is preterm um, labor. In the column in the middle from this particular review article, you can see um, not much is known about other species. So NHH, which you see on the top here, refers to non-human hominoids, so apes, the great apes. Um, and so while preeclampsia is common in humans, it's rare question mark in great apes, meaning nobody knows and still nobody knows how common these disorders are. And, you know, it's tough to take the, um, the blood pressure of, for example, uh, pregnant uh, gorillas throughout their um, gestation. So, so that's, that's just um, highlighting so much more work needs to be done if we're to understand more about the evolution of pregnancy and the evolution of the placenta and in the context of clinical management, the evolution of obstetrical syndromes. Um, one, one aspect of placentation is the development of the fetal membranes, um, which everyone's familiar with. Um, so, so we have done a study on the the evolution of, of membrane rupture in mammals. And um, because um, not much was known about it. It was a difficult um, thing to study, but just to highlight what's up with the rupture of membranes, you know, the breaking of the water, you have spontaneous rupture at term. Sometimes you have prom, which, means the water breaks before labor starts, and then P-prom, which um, the membranes rupture before 37 weeks of gestation. It's fairly common. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's call birth, which means the membranes cover part or all of the, the newborn. And so this is a fairly rare thing in which the, in which the infant comes out in the gestational sac. And we underestimate this because as 
the obstetricians in the room know, sometimes we strip the membranes before the delivery. Um, so here's a picture of a call birth. Um, and here's what we see in some other creatures. So um, this, this seal um, up on the right, it's actually a sea lion. Um, a postdoc of mine took a picture of this this um, baby seal in, in the sack at the beach in San Diego. But we see this in, in we see ruptured membranes in chimpanzees and non-ruptured membranes in creatures like horses. And so, you know, in trying to study the evolution of this, it was, it was challenging because um, mammals in particular, when they give birth, they go hide and they deliver at night um, and they need to be alone so they don't get um, predated um, and, and gobbled up by various predators. Um, so, so it's hard to study um, from a natural history perspective Whereas just looking at placental anatomy, all you have to do is, is um, you know, examine pregnant creatures um, in, in, in the lab and stuff like that. But it occurred to us that we could um, look at YouTube videos and, and observe the birthing pattern in different species to see if they had um, ruptured or unruptured membranes. Um, and so that the, these are some other some other um, YouTube studies that that came out. Um, what I'll show here, if you can see this, are some examples of how the how the births happen in different creatures. So we have a horse on the left and an orca on the right. Um, the horse uh, the 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 um, I guess is born with an intact gestational sac, and on the on the right, the 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 baby is born um, with with um, ruptured membranes. Similarly, we're looking here on the left, another example of intact gestational sacs um, in a dog, and on the right. We see a chimpanzee delivering, and the the membranes are are, are ruptured. Now, um, I apologize if this grosses anybody out, but um, uh, on the left is an elephant delivering, and you can see the gestational sac is intact. Um, and on the on the right, you see a a hippo giving birth. Um, the elephant is going to um, be born now. And as you can see, it falls to the ground and it's quite an impressive feat. Um, similarly with um, giraffes, they come with partially intact gestational sacs um, versus pigs on the right, um, where you see um, how they're born. Um, without that, without that sac intact. So we were able to observe this in about 55 species of mammals. We have people searching YouTube in all different languages. Um, it was kind of fun. And um, for, that's probably enough examples. Um, what, what we were able to show is that the intact gestational sac um, was most likely the, the ancestral state uh, for for placental mammals and um, ruptured gestational sacs um, emerged at different times. Um, um, and the intact gestational sac that we have is is convergently evolving. It's a good example of convergent evolution. So so that's when you start, thinking about these parameters in placentation and in membrane evolution, fetal membrane evolution, you know, you have to think about, okay, what kind of um, animal studies can you do? And from, it's just my opinion, but I think we need 
denser taxon sampling. Um, and we need to, if we're gonna study something like preterm birth in animal models, we need to move away from induced models of preterm birth. In other words, most models of preterm birth are um, infection-based models where LPS or some other um, agent is given to the pregnant mouse to, to induce preterm birth. And, and that makes sense because a lot of preterm birth has to do with infection, um, but not all of it. And certainly um, not often PPROM. So, so we did a study recently where we were looking at the at the at the membrane evolution um, in in mice, and we were looking at a particular model of 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 membrane um, biology in a particular type of mouse um, because we wanted to study um, premature rupture of membranes um, in 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 mice. And we know in humans about a quarter of preterm birth has to do with um, PPROM. And so these are the membranes. It's not always the same membranes in the different creatures. There's anatomical variation. In humans, we have various risk factors, which I'm listing here. One is um, a genetic cause um, called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So first thing when we're studying mice versus humans for something like fetal membranes or placentation, um, we have to think about gestational comparisons. So, so a mouse will have a 21 day gestational length compared to our 40 week gestational length and rough estimates are that like from E15 to E18 in mice, day 15 to day 18 is around 26 to 34 weeks of comparable human gestation and E21 is analogous to 40 weeks gestation. So there is a lack of transcriptomic profiling studies investigating temporal changes across gestation in preterm birth in human and animal models. Um, there's many reasons for this, I'm happy to discuss those. So we looked at um, some double knockout mice at two different gestational ages to see how the transcriptome was changing and which pathways um, were involved in, in this mouse model, which is a model of preterm birth. So these, these double knockout mice tend to deliver their pups prematurely um, at day 15 to 18. And what these genes do, or the proteins encoded by these genes, they're necessary for the form maintenance of gestation um, to full term, we believe. So what we did is we got RNA from the fetal membranes in um, the wild type and the double knockout mice at um, E12 and E18. And then we did RNA-seq, got a lot of data, and what we um, came up with is that two um, main pathways were really changing um, as gestation proceeded in the mice. And this have to do with the complement cascade, which has to do with um, immunology, and then the cell cycle cascade, the cell cycle um, thing. So like, that's interesting to us because these, these genes that are knocked out are also known when they're mutated to be involved in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, and you can see this dog on the right um, has, has, has an example of that in which the connective tissues becomes uh, less, uh, less tensile. Um, and and, and the same thing happens with the membranes. Um, and the, the genes that we were knocked out in our mouse model um, are involved in this syndrome as well. And the idea is that recurrent PPROM may be associated with underlying connective tissue anomalies. Um, this is just a cartoon showing some of the genes that are in the complement cascade and that are differentially expressed 
in in these mice as their gestation goes on. This is just cartoons showing um, what these proteins are um, that by glycan and decorin, um, they're leucine rich proteoglycans. Um, uh, they, their, their structure is shown here in this picture. Um, what they do is they bind collagens and that's where we get the tissue connectivity issues when they're not binding those collagens. Um, so they, they regulate um, fibrillogenesis, cell growth, and again, inflammatory processes. So if we look at the, the construction of fetal membranes, you can see there's different layers of cells, um, placental cells, trophoblast cells, decidua, um, and, and so forth. And the, the collagens are here. Um, in human studies, um, by, by glycan expression increases whereas decorin um, expression is reduced um, in, um, after labor occurs. And um, decorin is also significantly reduced in human fetal membranes uh, with PPROM and infection. So if we looked at, the, at our, our data, um, if we looked at E12 comparing the wild type and the double knockout mouse model, only 97 genes are differentially expressed. But at E18, we see a massive shift in gene expression and the wild type and the double knockouts have over 3000 genes differentially expressed. And this is FDR corrected, et cetera. Um, the top 10 molecular pathways shown here are um, in many ways not, not um, surprising. I've already mentioned this cell cycle in the complement cascade, um, coagulation. You can see some, some other stuff here too, um, including extracellular matrix, matrix receptor interactions. There's 50 differentially, differentially regulated transcripts in the cell cycle and 31 in the complement cascade. So th these, these two pathways are undergoing massive shifts. These are some of the genes that are changing their expression. Um, and this is um, showing where some of the, the um, genes fall within the cell cycle. So, um, what we think is happening, and we have to confirm this, is that the cell cycle gets arrested and the cells can't divide anymore. And um, ultimately that, that ends up in causing them to break and, and the rupture to occur. We see similar things in colon cancer. And um, cell growth is retarded um, in, in, in cancer cells and so on. So um, if you just knock out one of these genes, um, the, 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 the deliveries of the mice is not preterm. So um, the idea is that the knockout model that we're looking at has a profound effect on the transcriptome of mouth fetal membranes and possibly um, is involved in um, the induction of preterm birth um, via many mechanisms, including PPROM. All right, I'll close since I, I know um, we're running short of time with a, a human specific story in terms of, in terms of the placenta and, and evolution. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about high altitude placentation. So as, as, as we all know, abnormal fetal growth costs a lot of money per year, it's US, dollars here. Um, IUGR or fetal growth restriction um, is very common in individuals who reside at high altitude. And the, the logic, which goes back to Erasmus Darwin, has to do with the reduced oxygen at high altitude um, makes it more challenging for the fetus to grow in, in that um, high altitude environment. However, 
in places around the world, the one I'm going to talk about today, um, South America, we know that indigenous Andeans have physically adapted to the high altitude environment. So this individual on the right has this classic uh, barrel chest, which allows for larger lung volumes. There's increased hemoglobin saturation, and which allows the, the red blood cells to carry more oxygen in the environment where less oxygen is, is readily available. That's not the case for Spanish people who moved to places like Bolivia in the last several hundred years or Japanese folks or any, anybody else. What we see is that um, individuals of um, European ancestry, um, mixed ancestry, have um, lower birth rates at, at um, high altitude compared to low altitude. And that the, the European folks, this, this reduction in birth weight is um, quite a, more extreme than you see what happens with the Andean folks. Um, this is just another way of showing it. Um, this is from some of the studies that, that, that we've worked on. And what you see in terms of birth weight the high altitude Andeans have a have a greater birth weight than the high altitude Europeans. This is the left um, panel where there's no significant difference um, between the low altitude Andeans and the low altitude Europeans. So this study was done in um, La Paz, Bolivia for the high altitude and Santa Cruz, Bolivia for the low altitude. Um, as far as capillary surface area, however, we see um, at the placenta, we see um, a great increase in the high altitude Andeans, suggesting maybe there's some, some oxygen stuff going on there. If we look at um, gene expression in placentas of high versus low altitude Andeans, we find not a lot of differentially expressed genes, nothing like that mouse study I just showed, but 30 some um, meet our criteria for false discovery rate and so on. And um, the pathways we see are mostly involved um, with immunity, um, some angiogenesis, um, some genes are associated with um, Hofbauer cells, um, some associated with um, syncytialization, which is an important um, part of syncytiotrophoblast formation. So the Andeans, basically show increased angiogenesis at high altitude, um, which can protect them from preeclampsia. The Europeans at high altitude in, in, in Bolivia have incredibly high um, rates of preeclampsia, 20 to 30%, whereas the, the Andean rate of preeclampsia, the indigenous um, rate there is more on par with what you see globally in like the five to 10% um, rate of preeclampsia. So um, that increased angiogenesis may have given them an advantage. Um, so we see an, up, an increase of inflammatory cytokines an expression of pro-angiogenic genes and increased capillary surface area in the high altitude Andeans. Um, and my former graduate student, who's now an assistant professor, Will Gundling, proposed that um, CCL2 in particular attracted Hofbauer cells to induce angiogenesis in Andean placentas. And he's still working on that. Um, yeah. Um, that's ancestry dependent. There's also genes that are expressed differentially solely based on altitude, not having anything to do with um, ancestry. Okay, and here we see some very um, important um, transcription factors um, in the AP1 transcription factor family, um, which um, when inhibited um, leads to decreased capillary 
surface area, which is, is what we see um, being increased at high altitude. So this is a, a little cartoon about that. So the inhibition of that increases um, capillaries. So I see I'm running out of time, so I will just sum things up now and, and just say that human placentation um, is a combination of evolutionarily conserved and derived features. Uh, we have hemochorial placentation, which is an ancestral feature of mammalian evolution. There's incredible gene expression diversity um, in the placenta across species, and uh, much more remains to be learned about that. And um, as also um, other aspects of epigenetics and, and uh, genetic sequence evolution. Um, one thing um, that we rely on in, in science are animal models, and we need to continue to do that, but we need to um, improve those animal, animal models um, to um, really understand obstetrical syndromes. I didn't talk about it before, but in, in that, that study of the, of the double knockout mice, we also looked at the evolution of the genes that were differentially expressed. And, and many of these genes um, show the, the hallmarks of adaptive evolution um, when comparing humans and mice. Also, there's recent adaptations that, um, such as the one I described in Bolivia, which can offer clues about um, treatment and therapeutic uh, advances in understanding obstetrical syndromes, because a lot of natural experimentation has occurred around the globe, and we can we can harness that variation to understand which genes and um, which genes are advantageous, which variants of which genes are advantageous in, in differing environments. And hopefully that will pave the way to understand a little bit about um, human obstetrical syndromes. So um, that's it. I'd like to acknowledge many people. This is a very incomplete list. A lot of people at the PRB, um, Gunter, um, a lot of people at Wayne State, a lot of people at the University of Illinois, a lot of people at University of South Florida when I, where I am now. And um, I'm happy to uh, take questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, 